Okay, so what we're going to do this month is going to look at forklifts, we're going to look at uh, boom and scissor lift, and then we're going to go ahead and look at fall prevention and fall protection, and we'll just hop right on in. Uh, here's a, a good example. We're starting with forklift safety, and here's a good example of, of what you can do with a forklift, but uh, everything after this video clip is going to be uh, how to operate poorly on a forklift. So let's go ahead and see if we can get this clip popped up. So, safe operation of forklifts and other powered industrial vehicles, and we're going to cover uh, how these fatalities and in injuries happen, the types of forklifts that are out there, how a forklift operates, and uh, the hazards of, the, of that operation, and how to use the forklift safety, safely, of course. Um, so forklifts are used all over industry and in construction, and just about anywhere where you have to lift something heavy, your odds are you're going to be working around or even on a forklift at some point in time. Um, property damage, injury, death, uh, anytime you're not trained to operate the forklift safely or if you're not familiar with that specific type of forklift that you're operating, uh, if you're just operating in an unsafe manner in general or if you're operating a forklift with a defect or some sort of missing parts, that's when you start getting into these accidents and injuries and uh, here's a pretty, pretty stark example I guess you could say. Forklift has driven off the front of a dock with a bomb on the front of it. so. Um, and here's one of the more famous ones that we've probably all seen at one point or another. If you've been through enough safety training, a uh, big forklift, lifting a little forklift with our guys on it, you know, um, just because you can doesn't mean you should. Like I said, a lot of uh, poor ways of, of working with the forklift. And of course, if your forklift is too small, just have your buddies hop on the back and provide more weight as a counterweight. Of course, we would never do that. But uh, there's so many examples out there online. If you Google uh, forklift uh, unsafe or forklift fails, you'll find all sorts of stuff like this. So moving on, you have to be at least 18 years old in order to operate a forklift. That is the law. Um, forklift accident statistics. And it says there 85 to 100 workers in the U.S. are killed every year in forklift accidents. And then it breaks it down over here where 42% uh, of the time, uh, the fatality occurred from uh, being crushed by the vehicle as the vehicle was tipping over. So you're not supposed to leap from a forklift. And uh, that's what that is talking about. Uh, the person is crushed between the vehicle and a surface, 25% uh, of the time. Crushed between two vehicles, 11%. Struck or run over by a forklift, 10%. Struck by falling material, falling off of that forklift, 8%. And fall from the platform on the forks. That's where people get up onto a pallet and they get raised up to change out a light bulb. They wind up falling off. Of course, we don't do that either. And here's looking at Washington uh, State as just an example. 13 employees were killed in forklift-related accidents between 2000 and 2009. And then you had 1,000 plus employees who were seriously injured uh, 2006, 7, and 8. And then uh, the five most common citations that are issued uh, around forklifts uh, would be lack of training, no seatbelt or not using the seatbelt as provided. No inspection of the forklift for defects, that's your pre-shift operational checks. Uh, modifying the forklift without the manufacturer's approval, that's a big one. And then no nameplate or an unreadable nameplate. So we're looking at what exactly is a powered industrial truck, and then you can see there in our pictures, anything, really it's, it's, it's got to be powered, of course, it's, and it's got to be used to carry, push, pull, lift, stack, or tier materials. These are all governed by OSHA um, under 1910.178. And then we have, uh, I think, seven different classes of powered industrial trucks. Uh, we don't really need to know necessarily what differ differentiates each one, each one from the other, but um, you can kind of see here your class ones are going to be electric. Class two electric stand-up, looks like. And then uh, class three is going to be your powered, uh, whether it's a walkie or a ride-along, your, uh, your uh, 
uh, pallet, your electric pallet jacks here. And then in class four, I think for our company, this is pretty much where we where, where we're at. It's going to be propane powered uh, solid tires. And uh, let's see here, class four, class five steps it up to air filled tires. And there are four different ways to power these these forklifts: gasoline, diesel, propane, electric. Uh, moving on to our class six industrial type stuff, we're, we're kind of getting out to the industrial tractors or the yard tractors. And then class seven rough terrain type trucks that you might see in a log yard or on a construction site. And they're good for, for driving off-road or on rough, rough surfaces, whereas uh, our class four types really aren't good for, for driving on, on dirt or any type of rough surface that needs to be smooth concrete. And here, some examples of what power industrial trucks would not be. And then uh, just a regular non-powered pallet jack, any type of farm vehicles. And then it says there's self-propelled uh, elevated work platform, any type of earth moving vehicles and bobcat skid steers, not powered industrial trucks, according to the law. And how is a forklift different from a car or truck? Well, usually a forklift is going to steer from the rear instead of the front, which makes the, the rear end swing out wide. And these lifts are made to carry heavy loads and often in tight spaces. And they're notorious for having reduced visibility for the operator. They're going to have a, they can have a high center of gravity, especially with the load and the higher up that load is lifted. That makes it susceptible to turnover. And the controls are going to be different and more complicated than in a car. And your forklifts are going to be heavier than most cars and trucks. So just because you can operate a car or a truck doesn't mean you can operate a forklift. That's why there's a training program in place. Uh, every forklift that you have out there is going to have a, is supposed to have a nameplate on it, and that's going to give you all the information that you're gonna need as far as how much can it lift safely, what is the, the weight of, of that vehicle itself, and, uh, and what type it is. Forklift operating manual should always be provided on the forklift itself, and you can see there in that picture on the left, um, that they usually make a little plastic case where you can store that manual, and that's there for the operator's convenience. And we're gonna go into the concept of uh, the stability triangle, and you can just to kind of set this scene up a little bit. Of course, we've already got a person providing a counterweight, so that's all, all, obviously not a good situation already. But uh, they've got this load lifted too high, and it's a little bit too heavy. And this person is going to stop very quickly, and then we're going to see what happens when the, the weight uh, moves outside of that stability triangle. So what would have helped there is if they had lowered that, that load as close to the ground as possible, that would have eliminated that, uh, that forward tipping motion that you saw and could have prevented that, uh, what I assume is a fatality. Um, so yeah, so there's our forklift stability triangle. And uh, you can just imagine a three-point triangle underneath your forklift. And um, yeah, it's got four wheels, but it's a three-point uh, position. Uh, the truck steer axle is attached to the truck by a pivot pin in the axle center. And... Um, when that point is connected to the front wheels with imaginary lines, that three-point support forms a triangle called the stability triangle. So as long as the center of gravity remains within the stability triangle, the truck is stable and will not tip over. And then here's an illustration. You can kind of uh, see this here where you're going to be balancing basically on your front wheels. And, uh, and then on your illustration on the right, the higher up you lift that cargo, and uh, if you start moving or if you start trying to turn or if you stop too soon then you're going to be a lot more likely to uh to tip over or tip forward because you are outside of the stability triangle and so that's why we we always tell people don't travel with a raised load not for any reason okay all right so when carrying a load near the maximum allowable capacity you have to be aware that there is a, an increased danger of tip over and increased danger of losing that load and increased danger of being, or someone, a pedestrian being struck by a falling load, okay? And here's a good example here of how to, uh, of how to move things around, how to uh, 
pre-position them so that you're not going to lose anything. Keep things nice and stable. Uh, put all put as much of the weight as possible towards this uh, this back rest here, and then you wouldn't want to do it like this. All right. So when moving the load for security, tilt the mass back and forks back and position the heaviest part of the load against the carriage. This is how you cradle a load to carry it safely forward. Uh, traveling with the mass tilted back keeps the load stable and within the stability triangle. Never travel with the load tilted forward, okay? So if you stop all of a sudden and you've got your load tilted forward, you're going to wind up losing that load. And if you're going to be driving on an incline, very important, is always drive with the load on the uphill side. And if you're, um, if you're going to go down a ramp, you need to go backwards uh, driving down the incline and then frontwards going up the incline. So just as you see there. And if there's no load on the forklifts, do the opposite with the forklifts pointing down the ramp. But keep in mind, you need to keep them up just a little bit. So when you get to the bottom of the ramp, you're not going to scrape your forks on the ground. Okay. There's some more reasons why forklifts tip over. And yes, even empty forklifts have been known to tip over. Driving too fast around a corner, driving off the edge of a platform like we saw with the guy with the bomb, uh, driving off the edge of a ramp, um, driving an indoor forklift outdoors on rough, uneven ground and turning on an incline or a hill. And you're never supposed to turn on an incline, no matter what. That's when you get unstable. Yeah, so never jump outside of your lift. If it starts to tip, you need to stay inside. You need to have your seat belt on. Okay, so fasten seat belt, don't jump. Hold on tight to the steering wheel, brace your feet, lean away from the impact, and even lean a little bit forward. So uh, like we saw in those fatality examples, I think most people were killed because they tried to jump out of the forklift as it was tipping. They were killed by that, uh, that overhead cage. Seat belts are required on all forklifts manufactured since 1992 and can be retrofitted on all older models. And you're required to use it whenever you are in motion, okay? It doesn't matter if you're going to travel two feet or 20 feet or 200 feet. You need to have your seatbelt on when you're in motion and it's there to save your life. Forklift inspection and maintenance. All lifts are to be examined uh, typically before the shift starts. And then um, you're going to be looking at things like your fluid levels, oil, water, hydraulic fluid, uh, leaks, cracks, any defects in the hydraulic systems or the mass chains, making sure that your tires are in good shape. Um, condition of the forks, making sure that they are not bent up, scraped up too bad or anything like that, or not warped. Uh, safety decals and nameplates in place and legible, and all your safety devices are working properly, including the seatbelt. And if that forklift is found to be damaged, you need to write it down on your port, hand it over to your supervisor, and have that addressed. So here's some common examples. You know, if your forks start looking like this, it might be time to get some new forks. Obviously, this would be a, a prime example of Go ahead and, and turning in your forklift and having it uh, taken out of service for a while until they can get that fork replaced. And your solid tires, they will chip off eventually, especially if they're driven on rough surfaces or, the, or if they're driven over obstacles. Even things like pallet boards that are on the floor um, are notorious for chipping out these, uh, these solid tires. And of course, you shouldn't be out there with any type of plastic wrap holding your stuff together. That's, that's just not professional or safe, right? So repairs to a lift may only be made by those trained and authorized to do so. And uh, most companies just contract out with uh, their, their nearest forklift vendor, and they are the ones who are trained and authorized. Um, so refueling a propane-powered lift like ours, I believe they're all um, propane-powered. So it's going to be cold when it gets released into the atmosphere if there's a leak. And if your skin is exposed to that propane leak while refueling, uh, refueling you can get frostbite. Uh, you need to shut off the engine before refueling. Uh, don't leave your, your propane-powered lifts near high heat sources and um, turn off the tank, the, turn the tank valve off if you're going to be parking for a long time so that you don't waste all that propane. And any propane leak must be taken seriously. Um, and if it's not taken care of immediately, you could have a fire or an explosion. And uh, if you ha happen to have the type of lift that has two of these brackets that hold the, the tank in place, you need to use both of those. You can't just get away with just using one and leaving the other one open. But most of ours, I think they just have a single bracket. So um, let's see here, charging or changing batteries on the electrics. Um, 
and I guess this would go more in line with our electric pallet jacks but there will be a, a changing or a charging area you're not supposed to smoke in these areas because of hydrogen uh, gas that the batteries are known to produce uh, there needs to be fire protection in the area you need to have plenty of water on hand for flushing and neutralizing any spilled battery acid you should have an eye wash station in that area and enough ventilation to remove the hydrogen gas during the battery charging process and uh, if you're having to add water to your batteries there's a whole line of PPE that would go with that now your forklift attachments um, there's all sorts of those that are out there uh, the load capacity of the forklift is reduced by the weight of the attachment and that attachment has to be approved by the forklift manufacturer so we can't just go out there and make our own attachment and just willy-nilly throw that on and then expect to still be within the, the legal requirements uh, so that's not the case a lot of times if you get a Toyota lift they're going to have their own attachments that they've designed and verified and certified themselves and you're going to be uh, kind of stuck using what what you're what they're going to allow you to use and uh, be sure to know how to use a specific attachment on the forklift you'll be operating or get training if you don't know how to use it so real quick on stacking loads on pallets um, trying to keep the load stabilized and together and not falling off and injuring products or injuring people um, there's good ways to stack typically what you see here is the block style it's not interlocked or anything like that but you can strap them down uh, tape them uh, stretch wrap them uh, and then you have your, your brick style for when that's appropriate where you kind of interlock all these together and that makes a really stable uh, load and then it kind of goes on with some more stuff um, and you kind of see things like this uh, not as stable but hopefully you know that they put the cardboard uh, in between they can band these they can wrap these to make them more stable and avoid using damaged pallets and you're not supposed to leave a pallet standing up on its side OSHA has written uh, companies up for people who have left pallets on their sides and they're known to fall over and strike people uh, I actually worked at a place where that had happened once so make sure that if you've got pallets you're not standing them up on their sides forklift work platforms here's what I was telling you about where people were falling off and, and getting killed uh, because of stuff like this it's not allowed at all we never lift other workers on forks unless you use an approved work platform with the railings as shown and so this would be um, one of the groups that this Pelsu group and Heister they probably have a, a deal worked out where where they can uh, attach one of these uh, these man baskets and then that is okay by Heister but you would never um, make one of these up in your maintenance shop and uh, not being verified or rated or, or engineered or anything like that that would not be acceptable so it has to be a professionally engineered professionally made product and you can see here yes yeah, this is probably one of the worst things you can do um, and both people would be in trouble in that case the operator who let it happen and the person who agreed to get up there on the pallets now, here's a situation where someone is driving forward and they can't see um, they can't see around the load that they've got in front of them so they're driving blind and then they strike our pedestrian and they crush our pedestrian and then this guy lowers the load to the ground well he should have been in reverse and looking over his shoulder and sounding the horn but unfortunately that did not happen okay Forklifts have reduced visibility, as we just saw. Both the forklift mast and a large load on the forks can reduce the forward visibility. And uh, you can see here there is the older designs where you had the chains and the columns and everything all spread out. Uh, they, the newer ones, they try to kind of consolidate them to each side, so at least you've got some front view here. But keep in mind, these are basically big blind spots. Okay? So we say travel in reverse, use a spotter if you've got a load blocking your view, and drive slowly. Uh, with, even without a load because you still have these blind spots and people can can hide inside these blind spots pretty easily um, so always use that horn as well and here's a here's a good example of our operator and if someone were to be walking right in line with this blind spot that forklift operator would never know that you were there uh, yeah. and here's this woman here is, is walking right in line with that blind spot and they cannot see each other until it's too late that's a perfect example of that okay. 
All right, so forklifts and pedestrians, as we just saw, slow down and sound the horn at intersections, corners, wherever your vision is obstructed. And when provided, use flashing warning lights or backup alarms when traveling in reverse. Always look in the direction of travel, of course. Signal to pedestrians to stand clear. Don't allow anyone to stand or walk under your raised forks, whether you got a load on or not. And when possible, pretty much always, make eye contact with the pedestrian or the other forklift operators before moving in their path. And you need to determine the right of ways. It's not so, so easy as saying, oh, the forklift always has the right of way or the pedestrian always has the right of way. What I say is you both need to look at each other and determine who gets the right of way. And that's the safest way to go about that. And then uh, here's a case where forklift operator is reversing out of a spot and uh, winds up with the, the rear end swing, not looking in the direction of travel. Uh, maybe the uh, even the pedestrian was aware of what was about to happen. So this stuff happens. Had a, had a safety boss who got in that same situation where he was pinned up against the wall. It didn't hurt him or anything, but it scared him half to death. So this stuff happens. And then uh, loading truck trailers and railroad cars. Lift operator's responsibility is to make sure that the truck trailer wheels are chalked or locked and the dock board is secure and can handle the weight. The trailer floor is stable and you use the horn or warning lights when exiting the trailer or a rail car. I know Clarksville has a, a blue light that points forward and one that points backward. And depending on what gear you're in, whether forward or reverse, that light will shine in that direction. And that helps out a lot, especially coming out of a truck trailer. And uh, there we have that example. Clarksville is also experimenting with these uh, red line lights. And that's to communicate the three foot rule where pedestrians should never cross uh, the red line light. And the idea is the only time it's safe to, to get closer than this light is when the operator turns off the lift and kills those lights, then that person can approach. All right, wider or regular size loads. Distribute the weight evenly, of course, uh, when carrying your regular size loads. Keep the center of gravity of the load as near as possible to the center, going horizontally across the forks and uh, keep that as close to the forklift as possible. And then loading or unloading from high storage racks. When removing a load from a high rack, you need to slowly back out with the load, stop when it clears the rack, and then lower the load to the floor. And remember, don't lower the load while you're moving. That makes you unstable forklift do's and don'ts. So no, no riders here, okay? No, no, nobody gets to ride along unless that forklift is, is designed for a, 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 a passenger. Always drive the forklift lower just inches from the ground and uh, lower the forks to the floor when parking the forklift. And then watch your overhead clearances, especially when you're going in and out of buildings. Uh, you could strike uh, things like, uh, like pipelines, things of that nature. So here's one of those what's wrong here pictures. And I think it's fairly obvious the way that these forks should be. The front end of these forks should be flat on the ground and this back end should be picked up a little bit to allow for that. But this is basically one big trip hazard at this point. Uh, your risk to the rider. So a seasoned forklift operator sat next to the operator's seat while showing a new operator how to operate the lift. And then um, the forklift ran into one of the pillars at the site and this person was hanging off the side. You can see here with his leg. And then uh, he was trapped, crushed between the pillar and the forklift. So we need to keep our hands and feet and everything inside of the forklift at all times. Stay out of the mast because here's a situation where a guy got out, was trying to, to straighten up a box, kicked one of his levers back, and pinched himself between the lift and the mast. Okay. And speed limits. Maintain a moderate walking speed on your forklift, okay? And then allow three truck lengths be, uh, between yourself and the next vehicle as following distance. Don't leave your forklift unattended, okay? So a forklift is considered unattended when the operator is 25 feet or more away from the vehicle, even if it remains in his view, or whenever the operator leaves the vehicle and it is not in his view. So when a forklift is left unattended, forks have to be fully lowered, controls neutralized, power shut off, parking brakes set, and the wheels have to be chalked if the truck is parked on an incline. And uh, let's see. Propane-powered lifts and carbon monoxide, especially if you're uh, in an enclosed area like the back of a truck trailer, uh, you can get some, some carbon monoxide produced from that, that process. Um, let's see. Um, so it says there, propane-powered forklifts are used indoors. They should be tuned up regularly and tested for carbon monoxide emissions periodically. 
So you really don't want to be leaving one of these lifts running, especially in a confined space, because that builds up carbon monoxide. Um, you have to have documented hands-on training on the specific truck you will be operating. And so we talked about the classes of trucks earlier. If you're uh, authorized for a class four and you move to a class two, guess what? You have to be uh, retrained, reauthorized, make sure that you're competent in handling that class of truck. And some more things as far as stacking, uh, make sure that we're not running into situations like this. Uh, improper stacking could cause collapse, collapse onto people, so on and so forth. And in closing, some reminders, always set the parking brake even when you're on a flat surface. This is one of the most common things that, that, that I see in, in industry, is people not setting their parking brake. That is required every time. Um, approach train tracks from a 45 degree angle. Always face the lift when getting on or off of it and use three points of contact. So that's two feet and a hand or two hands and a foot. Um, empty, and even an empty lift can tip over. Keep your hands and feet inside of the lift in case it would tip over. Um, or if, you, uh, if you're just driving around in general, keep your hands and feet inside. Never let anyone cross beneath a raised load. Never let anyone cross beneath the forks even without a load. And for pedestrians, uh, lights and buzzers, these are all great gadgets, but gadgets can fail. Um, keep in mind that nothing replaces good situational awareness. So not being distracted, don't be looking at your phone, uh, don't be working on paperwork while you're, you're walking uh, through a forklift like a congested area or something like that. So they're all very important things. All right, we're gonna move real quick into our boom and scissor lift type stuff. Uh, again, a lot of interesting pictures out there online. Uh, this is why we have boom and scissor lifts. So we shouldn't be improvising to try to get up higher like you see here. Um, now, it's one thing to, to have a boom and scissor lift, but you know you have to know how to use them safely, and that really doesn't count what you see right there. So, uh, let's see what we've got here. This is why you need to have on a ball harness and be tied off when you're in a boom lift, because it works like a catapult. So they had their harnesses on, all right, good deal, probably saved their lives. You have to be careful though, um, when you're working up high, not to wind up smashing yourself into any eye beams or things of that nature. That does happen. Keep your hands out of the this, uh, this accordion folding style of scissor lift, uh, because people have had their hands severely damaged, maybe even lost in that action. Um, and then sometimes, you know, even if you've got on a fall harness, um, may not, just because you got that on doesn't make you invincible. If you slam to the ground, that harness may not help you at all. So you got to be very, very careful. People get killed on these things every year. So let's see, we're just going to be talking about boom lifts and scissor lifts. Um, we don't really need to know, you know, all, all the different types that are out there. I'm not worried about that. Um, classic example of an articulating boom lift and then our scissor lifts. Okay. Um, let's see here. We, pretty much just like a forklift, you need to know the, the nature of any uh, lift hazards, electrical hazards, fall hazards, uh, dropping things out of the lift that could strike people below, um, and then how to, like your correct procedures for moving, uh, operating, repairing, inspecting uh, the lift, proper use of the lift, proper handling of, of, of materials on the lift, and then um, you need to know your your load carrying capacity. Um, employees have to be provided with operator's manual and maintenance manual for the lift being used. And then all of our operators, just like our forklifts, have to be able to demonstrate they understand how to safely operate these lifts 
and then we will certify them there and keep that hard copy in, in the records. And employees are to be retrained when, whenever there's changes in the work site that uh, uh, present a hazard not previously known to the employees, changes in the type of lift, or changes in fall protection, um, anything that comes up that people weren't aware of, and where inadequacies in an affected employee's work involving lifts indicate that, that employee did not re uh, retain the, uh, the proper proficiency. Um, so your training records, they need to be kept on hand for at least four years, and it should have you know all this information here. Selecting the right lift, uh, you have to keep in mind that the ones, the scissor lifts, for, for instance, that we use in industry, they're not really meant to, to go off-road or anything like that. They really need to be on smooth concrete. And then inspections, just like your uh, your forklifts, you're supposed to do inspections on these uh, these boom and scissor lifts, and that's at the start of each shift typically. And here's a uh, all about pre-planning your job safely and knowing uh, knowing your path of travel and being able to look out for stuff like this. So your pre-start inspection, you're looking at the emergency controls, operating controls. The boom itself, the guardrails if they're intact, the hydraulics, the outriggers, the emergency stop buttons, the tires, um, all those things. And these lifts will have a, an emergency descent system on the bottom. So if you get stuck up in the air and your battery runs out or whatever the case is, uh, you should be able to have somebody who can come around and then lower you down um, and save you that way. So you're not just stuck up there in the air. Um, we talked about the worksite inspections. Make sure you're checking the surface, just like that picture that we just saw. Hazards that might create dangerous driving conditions and your weather conditions. You don't want to be up in the air when it's trying to, uh, to thunder and lightning or the, the winds start to pick up, all right, because that is not a good situation. Uh, let's see, never remove or never bypass. Don't modify any safety features that are on these lifts for any reason, all right? That has to be done by the manufacturer. And then here's a, an article, we won't go into it, but someone had modified one of these, uh, these boom lifts and uh, they wound up crashing down to the ground and uh, dying in that case. So only authorized persons will operate an aerial lift and belting off or tying off to an adjacent pole structure or equipment while working from a lift is not permitted. So why? You know, this happens all the time where somebody forgets if they're tied off, they hit the controls to move they wind up pulling themselves out of the lift, and now they're hanging outside of the lift by their, uh, their by their fall harness. So employees should always stand firmly on the floor of the lift. They should not sit or climb on the basket or on the guardrails. They're not to use planks or ladders or buckets or any other items to attain a higher position. This is a very common thing that I, that I see um, that I've seen in the past. You have to keep your feet flat on the floor. Now here's a case where. You know, this guy, at least he's tied off and he's got a harness on. Okay, that's one thing. But here's a guy all the way up on top. He's got a harness on, but he's not doing himself any good if he's not tied off to anything. And what's even worse is there have been cases where people have fallen out of these lifts and they were tied on and the weight of them falling was enough to pull the scissor lift on over on top of them and they were crushed that way. Uh, of course, you never take the basket and put, uh, put planks across and improvise a platform. Nothing like this. This is not good. Very common situations here. You know, you kind of wonder what these people are thinking sometimes, but that is the reality. So be on the lookout for stuff like that. Um, okay, so just make sure that the load is balanced. Um, not much more to say about that. Um, let's see here. This should never be used as a crane unless the manufacturer has designed it to lift loads in such a manner. Hard hats have to be worn by employees at all times, especially if you're going to be down below uh, one of these lifts. You need to go ahead and rope off a safe, a safe zone around that lift to keep pedestrians and other uh, lifts or vehicles out of that area. And uh, before moving the lift, all employees should be made aware of the move. The operator should always refer to the lift operator manual for any safety procedures specific to that lift. Um, make sure that your brakes are set, and if the lift has outriggers, they have to be positioned on pads or a smooth, solid surface. Wheel chocks are always good, especially if on an incline. And um, let's see here, an aerial truck should not be moved when the boom is elevated in a working position with men in the basket, unless that lift is specifically designed for such operation. 
We talked earlier about the, the platform controls and then the, the lower controls on the bottom in case of emergency. Uh, those platform controls have to be in or beside the platform within easy reach of the operator. The lower controls uh, should be able to override the platform controls but should not be used unless permission has been obtained from the employees in the lift or in case of emergency. And then a quick thing on fault protection, all of your lifts are going to have some type of a, a, a tie-off lug or an attachment point. Um, and that's there. Um, if there is no anchor point available, it's up to the site safety supervisor to determine the best tie-off point. Uh, and, and again, we never tie off to an adjacent structure um, because you can be pulled out of the lift when you move. And only one person per tie-off point is what those are engineered for. And here's a pretty pretty clean example of, of what a good tie-off uh, lug or an attachment point would look like. So uh, one person per tie-off point. All right, now something here, if transferring from the lift platform to an adjacent structure is necessary, then 100% tie-off is required. And to perform the transfer, two lanyards are going to be required on that, on that back D-ring on the fall harness. One must be anchored to the platform and the other to the structure. And then um, that platform must be within one foot of the structure. Another employee on the ground should guide the operator when transporting the lift from one area uh, to another and uh, make sure that the boom is never over any employees that are working on the ground. And we, we're going to go right into fall protection right here. And thankfully, fall protection has come a long way since the 1910s and 1920s, as you can see there. Uh, moving into our video clip. So life comes at you fast, right? Especially when you're working up from heights. Different types of falls. Um, falls to the same level. These are your slips and trips. They happen pretty frequently. Typically low injury severity rate. And then we have, um, we have to keep in mind our housekeeping. Uh, good housekeeping prevents same level falls. And then keep your high work areas free from unsecured tools, materials, debris, and liquids. And then we have our falls from elevation. They don't happen very often, thankfully, because when they do happen, there's usually a high injury severity rate. And falls are usually the number one cause of workplace deaths, um, falling from a boom lift or a ladder. Yeah, those, that, all, that happens all the time, unfortunately. Uh, falls are dangerous because of the three primary elements, the free fall distance that the worker falls, shock absorption at impact. So are you falling onto uh, concrete or are you falling into water? Right, it's gonna make a difference. And the heavier they are, the harder they do fall. So during a fall, uh, says the free fall velocity at impact when falling 12 feet is nearly 20 miles per hour. And a person hits the ground in less than one second from that distance. Um, it's always good. You always have to be reporting these fall hazards if you find them. Employees don't experience repercussions for reporting hazards. An employee should report unsafe equipment, conditions, or procedures to the supervisor, safety, human resources. Now we have two types of, uh, we, we have fall prevention and we have fall protection. Fall prevention is a barrier that prevents or reduces the potential for a fall. Common example would be your guardrails, okay? But even things like uh, your covers for any floor openings and then no slip adhesives. And then make sure that if you have these, uh, these fixed ladders that they have uh, a gate on them, a safety gate, and make sure that you have, you have to, to pull this gate open in order to get down and you have to push it to get up. Um, otherwise, you could just fall right out of this and fall down the ladder. Uh, keep in mind, if you're going to be working up on the roof for any reason, that you've got some fall prevention in place around your skylights because people have been known to fall through those. Now we have fall protection, and that's the uh, something that, that physically restrains you or catches you when you do fall. And that would be your, uh, your fall harness, your, uh, your anchorage points, your connections. Uh, even things like safety nets and restraint systems it stops you if you do start to fall. So um, if you're going to be more than four feet or, or more above the floor or the lower level, you need to have on either a harness or you need to have your guardrails in place. If you're going to be working within 10 feet of an unprotected fall hazard, again, and then any, any height when exposed to unique or special hazards such as an open chemical tank, open moving machinery, molten metal, protruding objects, 
need to keep those things in mind. You know, your, uh, your fall harnesses, your fall arrest systems, those are there when you don't have your guardrails. Um, you have to wear these snugly. And when I say uh, snugly, like your, your leg loops here, you want to go ahead and, and cinch those down uh, to where you can just barely get your thumb in there. Uh, but if you wind up wearing these uh, leg loops too loosely and you do take a fall, uh, those legs loops will uh, cinch up around your, your groin and there have been some very nasty injuries to, uh, to the genitals. And you can Google that. Uh, it's really nasty. I, I decided not to show you those in today's presentation, but uh, just keep in mind wear those, wear your, your chest piece snugly, your shoulders snugly, and especially your leg loops, keep them nice and snug. And if you can fit a thumb in there very easily, then it's probably not tight enough. All right, so your fall arrest systems, prevent a worker from falling more than six feet, prevent a, any, uh, a worker from contacting any lower level during the arrest of the fall. And here's a, a bad situation where someone is wearing a, a body belt and those are no longer allowed. Um, because as you can see in the picture here, people would fall in these and they would basically snap themselves in half. So uh, on January 1st, 1998, that's the effective date for banning uh, these body belts. So those are no longer allowed. Uh, let's see here. So your shock absorption at impact, this is kind of the, the older way of doing things with these shock absorbing lanyards. Uh, but thankfully, things have, have gotten better in, in the past decade to where self-retracting lifelines are, are becoming more the standard. And, you know, lanyards are, are good and all, but, you know, you have to fall that full distance before it actually works, and then you can't really rescue yourself. Um, but the good thing, like you see here in this comparison, if you got a self-retracting lifeline, it's going to stop you pretty quickly because it's like a seatbelt mechanism, and this person here could still rescue himself if he had to, it looks like. Whereas this person has to go the entire length of the lanyard before his fall has been stopped. And another good thing, you know, these lanyards, they're easy to trip over. They get in the way. Um, your self-retracting lifelines are a little bit heavier and bulkier, but they at least they keep the lanyard up and out of your way. So that is another advantage. Um, let's see here. And keep in mind the pendulum swing. If you do fall, you have to be very careful about that. So if you do take a fall, you want to go ahead and put your hands up in front of your face because you might be going straight into a wall. Um, and so here's a situation where they tested, where they tested um, a simulated person or the weight of a person in a fall harness and on a, a lifeline. And they would have survived the fall, but they might have got skewered by the rebar sticking up. So you have to consider those things on your job site. As far as training, we're going through equipment inspection, uh, the limits of what you can do and what these uh, harnesses can, can handle, how to use them properly, and the donning and doffing and adjusting of the equipment. This is why training is so important, all right? You don't want to be that guy who puts his harness on upside down because <laughs> you look goofy and you're not helping yourself. Um, so here's kind of what a too loose of a harness would look like. And here's what a, a good example of a harness would look like. And this, this back ring, this D ring, needs to be back in between your shoulder blades. Um, if you take a fall in this, this thing is going to cinch up around the, the back of your head and you're going to wind up really getting hurt. Keep in mind we have to have our emergency rescue plans and implementation. Usually that means someone takes a fall, um, they should be working in a buddy system anyway, maybe they pull out a radio and call their person or, or they get a person to go get a scissor lift or a boom lift to rescue them. But we can't just leave that person hanging up there in their harness because they will eventually lose circulation and people have actually survived the fall but been found dead in their harness because they lost circulation. So time is, is very important in responding to these falls. When fall conditions exist, you need to take short steps, keep your toes pointed out, walk on the whole foot when crossing rough or slippery surfaces, avoid making sharp turns, and if you fall, protect your head and your neck with your hands. And then we're going to kind of get real quick through uh, how to inspect a fall harness or any type of lanyard material. You can do what that person is doing. Um, you're looking, uh, providing that tension, and you're looking for any type of cracks in the webbing or any cuts, especially deep cuts, looking for frayed edges, broken fibers, pulled stitches, cuts, burns, chemical damage. Um, your D-rings, make sure that those aren't warped, make sure that they're not rusted, uh, make sure they haven't been modified in any way. Uh, let's see here. Looking for cracks, of course, any bends. And your buckles, make sure that, they, uh, that they're connected strongly and securely to the, lanyard, uh, to the, to the fiber material itself. 
Again, shouldn't be rusted, shouldn't be warped. And then check your grommets, make sure that they're in the proper position and seated correctly. Looking at your buckles, you really want metal buckles and not plastic ones. Plastic buckles break all the time, but um, make sure that those are all in good condition. And your quick connect buckles, you know, engage them. Make sure that they're actually locking in and that, and that they, they, they can unlock. Okay. Make sure that that center tab, that button release works properly. Here's why we don't like uh, anything with plastic on it on our fall protection because it does warp, it does break, it snaps, and then you have to replace it. And it's kind of a pain in the neck. And make sure you're looking for uh, any type of welding burns or just burns in general. Anything that you see like this, you want to go ahead and pull that harness from service. Here's some handy stuff that is available out there. Um, beam straps, you got a, a big loop here and a small loop here. Small loop goes to the big loop, you tie off to your I-beam, and you're off to the races. All right. So you don't necessarily have to have an engineered tie-off point for every little thing. You can. Uh, there are some, some methods to, 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 to stay safe. And then here's a pretty good situation where I guess this guy is maybe on a roller rail here, and he's able to do what he has to do, but he's not going to fall because he's got that self-retracting lifeline that's going to catch him if he does fall. And then even stuff like this, you see stuff uh, like this on construction sites quite a bit where they, uh, they hook into the I-beam and then they have their length of line that they can travel along and that will protect them that way. And then even things like these, uh, these tie-off trees, I don't know what else to call them, but you can install those into the surface and then you got your tie-off points here. And here's something that's been engineered for working on top of rail cars, it looks like, where it's a, a rolling ladder, and you get on up there, then you tie off, and then you're good to go. And then here's a kind of a different example of that where you don't even need a fall harness because you've got your guardrails engineered in the whole time. So as long as you stay inside these guardrails, you don't need a fall harness. And of course, yeah, this is one of those situations where you're going to want a fall harness, but they make a spreader bar that clamps onto an I-beam, tie off to that, and uh, yeah, you've you've got a much better chance of, of not falling to your death. And then even things for working on top of roofs uh, where they make these counterweight systems. Just make sure that uh, this is on a flat level surface, single personnel use only, harness and lanyard not included, but not, not for use as a fall arrest anchor point. This is just a restraint system. Okay, so it's a restraint. It's gonna allow you to get so far and then it's gonna stop you and remind you that you need to stop at that point. You can't get any closer than uh, it says personnel must be restricted to within a minimum of six inches from the leading edge. So lots of, uh, lots of ways around the whole fall protection problems that are out there in business. And uh, if you guys are in the market for, for getting you know, fall harnesses, highly recommend DBI Sala and what you see right here. Uh, they make a very convenient, uh, no frills type of system. You've got these turnbuckles that adjust and you can get a, a custom fit every time. And you've got your, your leg buckles down here. They're very easy to work with. They've got a, a tensioning system there. And then you're gonna see here, they've in these little pouches, there's a, a, a loop, a cloth loop. If you do fall um, and you start, you're gonna start having that circulation cutting you off, you know, in your midsection, you can go ahead and open these uh, these pouches up and there's a loop in there and then you can stand up in that loop and stretch your legs out and that's going to alleviate all the pressure um, that's cutting off your circulation. So highly recommend DBI Solo. Rescue the victim as soon as possible. Of course, use the buddy system like I said. Have that rescue lift available at all times. Uh, hanging by a harness without a foot loop will quickly set off the, the blood circulation of the victim. Leads to unconsciousness and even death if left suspended. Um, so reporting fall hazards, your fall equipment repair and replacement receives the top priority and under no circumstances do we use defective fall equipment. And by defective we mean freight straps, uh, the rip stitching, if you pick up a harness and a big blue or red stitch is hanging out of it, that means that's the rip stitching, it means it's been involved in a fall, you don't want to use that. Um, warp D-rings, anything that makes you think twice about the safety of that harness, we don't want to be using that. And then if a harness is involved in a fall, it has to be pulled from service immediately and not be reused until a competent person inspects it for damage. Typically what we would do in that case is just cut it up and throw it away, order a new harness, don't even take a chance with it. Um, and we like to cut it up so nobody goes dumpster diving and then uh, pulls it out and then takes it home with them and then maybe gets involved in an, in an injury or a fatality at the home. 
some frequently asked questions, and we're coming to a close here finally. Uh, do harnesses and lanyards have an expiration date? Well, that depends upon the manufacturer. You need to contact them. Um, and typically, I'd, I'd probably say five years would be, a, would be a, an expiration date. After that, it's probably time to go ahead and replace it. Now, here's the big question. What about wearing a fall harness on a scissor lift? So we know you have to wear a fall harness and be tied off when you're on a boom lift. What about a scissor lift? Well, as long as you've got guardrails provided, you're not required by OSHA to wear fall protection while operating a scissor lift, assuming you're not transferring yourself from one structure to another. And if so, 100% fall protection is required. And uh, uh, however, employers can choose to exceed OSHA regulations by requiring you to wear one regardless. Problem is, like I said earlier, um, people have been tied off in a scissor lift. They've tipped over and they were not able to get uh, get away from that lift, from that scissor lift. And they were actually held to the lift and the lift fell over and crushed them that way. So that's why OSHA says you're actually not required to wear uh, fall protection when you're in a scissor lift. And then 100% fall protection real quick. This guy here, he's got his two lanyards on. He's going to hook into to one place and then he's going to go to where he needs to be and hook off to the next place. And then he will go back to where he was and unhook from that original spot and then go to where he needs to go. That's 100% fall protection. And if you do that, 100% fall protection 100% of the time, you will never have the chance to do a free fall. Um, and this is something that we covered earlier, but uh, make sure you keep your feet on the floor of that lift at all times. Um, the floor of the lift should be level with your access point. That's if you're transferring from one point to another. And so you, that's such you don't have to, to climb to, to get over to your access point. And it is okay to lean your upper body over the top rail as long as your feet stay on the floor of the platform. And then we saw earlier in that video, that's your boom lift. It's essentially a catapult. If you hit a little pothole, uh, you could get shot out of the basket. <laughs> um, and then our, our boom lifts, of course, you are required to wear fall protection and be tied off in case of the, the catapulting action. Here's, I think we've already covered this already, but here's that what's wrong with this picture. We should never be on any type of a, a pallet and be lifted up to do anything. It doesn't matter what you're going to do. It's not acceptable. Employee shouldn't be standing on an elevated pallet. Employee's not using fall protection. There's no guardrails. There's no harness. If a forklift is to be used to lift people, a safety cage has to be used. It has to be approved by the manufacturer of the lift. Homemade safety cages are not allowed. We're going to look at ladders just real quick as we're coming to a close here. Uh, new rules coming into place. Um, it's going to be a long time from now, but your fixed ladders are kind of being phased out. Um, anything that's, that's taller than 24 feet, it says there November 19th, 2018 cages are no longer considered compliant fall protection in newly installed ladders and to meet OSHA standards a personal fall arrest system or a ladder safety system is required. Now keep in mind um, you have until November 19th 2036 to comply with this okay so um, yeah if you guys have any questions on that contact me directly pause this video and uh, and look at these these notes that are on here but uh Keep in mind, this is something that's in play, but it's we, we have plenty of time to address it. And before we come to a close, we're going to look at ladders real quick to get that covered, and then we'll be done and we'll be out of here. Yeah, it's pretty bad. That's why you don't stand on the top. You don't stand on the top rung, or you don't stand on the apex, because if you start to uh, to fall. You're not going to be able to stop yourself. And of course, we don't stand on the very top. We don't use any type of buckets or shims or anything like that to get ourselves up higher. Pretty obvious what's going on here and what's wrong. Another situation, we got a ladder on top of the scaffold trying to install some lighting or change the batteries on a smoke detector. This stuff happens. We saw that guy earlier. Here's a guy, looks like he's changing the batteries on his smoke detector. <laughs> I guess he got up on his counter here and jumped up on his doors. And then stuff like this that you see at construction sites where people stack stuff up so they can get up a little bit higher and reach the work. It's not a good situation. Funny story, this is actually the town that I'm from and back in Oklahoma. And uh, this, I did not take this picture, but uh, one of my classmates did. So what's the worst that can happen? You got a tractor and you got a guy up in your scaffold. That's really not the way that should be handled. 
All right, here's a situation where a guy had his little ladder and he needed just to get up a little bit higher, so he took his little ladder and stacked it on top. And then you see this in construction uh, quite a bit, where people get into the bucket of a backhoe, and that's their that's their work platform at that point. None of that is allowed. And just in closing, your good ladder practices, inspect ladders before use. Look for missing cleats or any other signs of damage that could affect safety. Make sure it hasn't been run over by a forklift or something like that. When on a ladder, use the belt buckle rule. So you should never have your belt buckle outside of the frame of the ladder. Always keep three points of contact on a ladder. That's two feet, one hand, or uh, two hands and one foot. Don't occupy both hands with tools while climbing. Use a bucket or a tool belt. You'd usually have that bucket on the ground and have a rope tied off to you. And when you get up to where you need to be, pull that bucket up using your rope. It's good to tie off the ladder or have a spotter secure the ladder while you're up there. Never stand or set on the top rung or the apex of the ladder. Never straddle a ladder. Never improvise shims to reach higher. And know what a good ladder angle looks like. Don't stack it up very too vertical and don't stack it all the way out so it's going to slide out from under you. Your ladder should extend at least three rungs beyond your access point so you don't have to pull yourself up. It should be an easy transition. And don't lean a folding ladder to mimic an extension ladder. That's actually an OSHA violation. Uh, don't lean a folding ladder. Use fiberglass ladders as much as possible because metal ones are conductive to electricity and wooden ones wear out pretty quick. Um, fiberglass is pretty much standard nowadays. And don't ever hop the ladder in order to move it. And that's pretty much the conclusion. Um, I know this took a long time, almost an hour, but um, I thank you for sticking with me. And uh, if you ever have any questions, um, you can email me directly, call me, text me, um, whatever you need to do. I'm always here. So uh, I thank you for your time and attention. And have a good day.